Welcome back to the Emerging Civil War Virtual Symposium. I'm Chris Mikowski, Emerging Civil Wars editor. Thank you so much for joining us today online as well as on person. I want to give a thanks to our friends at C-SPAN for the great work that they continue to do to help promote American history. Uh, their work is absolutely invaluable. Our next speaker today is Kevin Pollack. Kevin is a registered guide at Antietam National Battlefield. He also works for Prince William County, and he has his own battlefield where he oversees a, the Bristow Station Battlefield. He also oversees the Ben Lomond Historic Site, which is a Civil War hospital area. Um, Kevin is the co-author of the Emerging Civil War series book, To Hazard All, a guide to the 1862 Antietam campaign. Today he's going to talk to us a little bit about the aftermath of the Antietam campaign, sort of the tail end that often gets overlooked, tying into an earlier talk today by Sarah K. Byerly, who talked about the Chambersburg Raid. Set in the larger context, uh, Kevin's going to talk a little bit about the Loudoun Valley campaign of 1862. Ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Pollack. Well, thank you, Chris, for that introduction, and thanks to all of you for uh, tuning in to our virtual symposium. We hope you'll be able to join us next year uh, in 2021 when we'll be reprising our uh, topic of what was supposed to be this year's topic of fallen leaders. But um, today I'm going to speak with you about the Loudoun Valley campaign, which is a campaign that does not get uh, a lot of, of study at all, unfortunately, in the larger scale of the Civil War. In fact, I'd probably wager that there are more people in this room, which I can count on one hand, uh, than there are books that talk about in any great detail the Loudoun Valley Campaign itself. So why the Loudoun Valley Campaign and what is the importance um, of this campaign? It's really one of those areas of the American Civil War, especially in historiography, that just gets glossed over. It's sort of an interlude period, if you will, between two of the major battles in the Eastern Theater. You have uh, before it, the Battle of Antietam, fought September 17, 1862, and then after it, you have the Battle of Fredericksburg in December of that year. But it's really this three-month period that is often not given uh, the amount of coverage that I believe it deserves uh, for, for various reasons. Um, where we're going to pick up our story before we get into the details of the campaign itself is right where the two armies last um, met in any great size, and that is on the fields and woodlots around Sharpsburg, Maryland, on September 17th of 1862, the bloodiest single day in American military history. In about 12 hours of fighting, 23,000 Union and Confederate soldiers will be killed, uh, wounded, missing, or captured, and that's about one person every two seconds for 12 straight hours. And so what happens on September 17th uh, is simply a, a minor uh, Union victory there on the Antietam battlefield. But both armies are uh, bled dry, essentially, by this latest action in the Eastern Theater of the war. September 17th of 1862 is not just essentially the high point of the Maryland campaign, but it's really the culmination of three months of almost constant campaigning between the two major um, armies, Union, one Union Army, the other the Confederate Army, in the Eastern Theater of the War. And so in that three-month uh, time period, there have been between the two armies about 92,000 casualties, which is the second bloodiest three-month span uh, between two armies in the entire American Civil War, and that's second only to the Overland Campaign uh, in 1864. But what's going to happen, uh, especially at Antietam, is not just are the armies, the individual soldiers going to be bled dry, but the high command will as well. Uh, George McClellan and the Army of the Potomac will lose two out of their six corps commanders, so about a 33% casualty rate for uh, the second highest level of command in uh, the Union Army. For the Confederates, they will lose about three, uh, actually three of their nine division commanders. And so again, both armies are not just bleeding from the bottom, uh, but they're bleeding from the top as well. And so what Robert E. Lee will do the night of September 18th is carry his army back across the Potomac River and into Virginia. There is a bit of a, um, a pursuit uh, on the part of the Union Army as the Union Army fans out across western Maryland to try and block all the different fords and crossing points of the Potomac River to make sure Lee does not get his army uh, back into Maryland and continue the campaign. But by September the 20th, the campaign is going to come to an end. And then, of course, just two days later after the campaign uh, in Maryland does conclude, you have one of the most uh, important 
uh, political actions of the entire war, and perhaps even of, of all of American history, and that is the Emancipation Proclamation. At least President Abraham Lincoln is going to announce to the country the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation on September 22nd, which is going to be a war-changing measure, and it signals uh, to both the Confederacy and the citizens of the United States just how the war has changed already in this year and a half and how it's going to continue to change and will forever change the United States uh, as we know it. So there is a lot of political background and political pressure to what's going to happen in the Loudoun Valley in late October and early November of 1862. And uh, this picture, very well known, very famous picture, taken uh, in early October of that year during Abraham Lincoln's visit to the Army of the Potomac in its camps around Sharpsburg, Maryland, really underscores the growing divide between Abraham Lincoln and the Army of the Potomac commander, George Brinton McClellan, whom you see there, of course, on the right side uh, of the photograph. Lincoln will come up to Sharpsburg, Maryland to visit the Army of the Potomac. He wants to see the latest battlefield victory see the field itself, the Antietam battlefield. Also, he wants to get a feel for the Army of the Potomac, uh, determine its state, determine what it can do next. But then also, Lee wants to talk with his commanding general, uh, George McClellan, and figure out what the next plan is. And it's very difficult to decipher exactly what was determined between the two during these meetings, because it depended on who you asked. George McClellan was under the belief that he himself got everything he wanted to out of Lincoln's visit up to his army, which was basically an assurance that Lincoln would support McClellan as McClellan sought to rebuild the Army of the Potomac in the weeks following uh, the Battle of Antietam. If you ask Abraham Lincoln what he got out of this meeting, he believed he got an, an assurance from George McClellan that the Army of the Potomac was going to continue its next campaign soon. However, as soon as Lincoln boarded a train in Frederick, Maryland and headed on back down to the executive office in Washington, D.C., uh, the rift began to grow once again, ever widening between George McClellan and his commander-in-chief, Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln was prodding McClellan to continue to move forward. McClellan kept uh, telling Lincoln that the army was not well supplied, and many contemporary accounts of soldiers in the Army of the Potomac bear out the supply issue that was taking place. Uh, eventually, the, the sores between McClellan and Lincoln would be opened up further by uh, events that took place in the middle of the month. And that would be Jeb Stewart's Chambersburg raid that my colleague uh, Sarah Byerly just uh, talked about, so I would refer you to her talk as well to get a little bit more information on it. But Stewart's um, itinerary, or, or goals if you will, in his Chambersburg raid was to ride around the Union Army of the Potomac, gather intelligence, capture some prisoners, capture horses potentially if he could, and in just a few days Stewart completely circumnavigates uh, the Union Army, again, in its camps in western Maryland. It's a ride of about 130 miles. He captures about 1,200 Pennsylvania horses. It's a very impressive feat, certainly. But I will add what Stewart is going to do here on this Chambersburg raid is he's going to damage uh, a lot of the horse flesh that is responsible for the success of the Army of Northern Virginia's mounted arm. And that's going to come into play uh, in just a couple of weeks when the armies will once again engage in the Loudoun Valley and in Northern Virginia. The bottom right of the screen, uh, you'll see what was Stewart's headquarters, known as the Bower, a home that's still standing in Jefferson County, West Virginia. Um, when Stewart's cavalry came back to the Bower, there was a great, grand celebration about this magnificent feat that Stewart's men had just accomplished. Harris von Bork, one of Stewart's staff officers that I'll be talking about a bit more lately, uh, talked about how the women were being brought from all over the countryside and all over the area to the Bower to celebrate this great feast. Uh, or feet, excuse me, and they were being pulled in wagons and large carriages by fat Pennsylvania horses and mules that Stewart's men had just captured in the preceding days uh, there in Pennsylvania. Now, Stewart's raid prompts a bit of confusion and fog of war amongst the Union High Command in the days after it. And reports reach uh, Army of the Potomac headquarters that the Confederate Army, which was positioned in the northern end of the Shenandoah Valley, or the lower end as it's known, uh, in the area around Martinsburg is roughly where Stonewall Jackson's troops were positioned, and then James Longstreet's Corps in the area around Winchester. Uh, intelligence reached McClellan's headquarters that the Confederate Army was in fact pulling out of the Shenandoah Valley. And so beginning on October 16th, McClellan dispatched two of the uh, best-known swearers in the Army of the Potomac's officer corps at this time uh, to mount two reconnaissances in force into the Shenandoah Valley to figure out just exactly where uh, and what the Confederates were actually up to. Uh, 
So in the upper portion of the screen, you'll see roughly the route that the column under the command of Andrew Atkinson Humphreys uh, takes going from Shepherdstown into the interior of Jefferson County, roughly the area uh, of Kearneysville. Today is about where they get to and, and a little bit beyond. The second column departs from Harper's Ferry on October 16th. This is one that George McClellan himself is going to personally accompany. And uh, that column is under the command of Winfield Scott Hancock. Hancock's men will arrive outside of Charlestown. There will be a brief battle in Charlestown, the county seat there in Jefferson County, uh, for a, a day or so. But ultimately, what these two uh, reconnaissances will show to George McClellan is that the Confederate Army is still very much in force there in the Shenandoah Valley. And all of this is happening as Abraham Lincoln and Henry Halleck and Edwin Stanton are continuing to try and prod George McClellan and the Army of the Potomac to begin its next campaign into Virginia. So what these reconnaissances show is that the Shenandoah Valley is still heavily defended by Confederate forces. Just a couple of days later, George McClellan is not going to look west of the Blue Ridge Mountains, but instead will look to the east side of the Blue Ridge Mountains, specifically the area between the Blue Ridge Mountains on the west and the uh, Bull Run or Catoctin Mountains on the east, which will frame the Loudoun Valley, which is going to be the uh, epicenter of the coming campaign. In the morning of October 21st, uh, a force under the command of John Gary, somebody very familiar with uh, Loudoun County before the war. Gary had actually been uh, head of an ironworks along the Potomac River in Loudoun County, so this was familiar territory for him. But Gary would uh, come with a combined force of infantry, artillery, and cavalry into the Loudoun Valley. You'll see their route with the blue arrows there on the map. They actually began basically just making a U uh, movement through the Short Hills, around Short Hill, and then up towards Lovettsville from Harper's Ferry. And on their way back, uh, they didn't find much, but on their way back towards Lovettsville, the 6th New York Cavalry under the command of Duncan McVicker, who will be killed in uh, the Chancellorsville campaign, is going to clash with elements of the 35th Virginia Cavalry at a place called Glenmore Farm. Uh, it's a, a very quick action, but it is something that is at least sketched by diff different uh, newspaper artists and sketch artists throughout the North, which is what you see there on the bottom right. And it is a resounding uh, rout of the Confederate forces. Many are driven from the battlefield and captured. Uh, and so what Gary's reconnaissance into the Loudoun Valley shows as compared to Humphreys and Hancock's reconnaissance is that the Loudoun Valley is relatively clear of Confederate forces. And so that is going to call into play um, Abraham Lincoln's developing strategy for the Eastern Theater of the War uh, as Commander-in-Chief of the Union Armies. On October 13th, while the uh, Confederate cavalry was in the process of getting around the Army of the Potomac, Abraham Lincoln would write a, a very wordy uh, letter to George McClellan outlining Lincoln's vision of what the plan might be for the fall campaign. And this is part of what Lincoln said to McClellan. You are now nearer Richmond than the enemy is by the route that you can and he must take. Why can you not reach there before him unless you admit that he is more than your equal on a march? His route, the enemy's, is the arc of a circle, while yours is the cord. The roads are as good on yours as on his. You know I desired but did not order you to cross the Potomac below, meaning east of rather than west of, uh, the Shenandoah and Blue Ridge. My idea was that this would at once menace the enemy's communications, which I would seize if he would permit. If he should move northward, I would follow him closely, holding his communications. If he should prevent our seizing his communications and move towards Richmond, I would press closely to him, fight him if a favorable opportunity should present, and at least try to beat him to Richmond on the inside track. I say try. If we never try, we shall never succeed. Nine days after receiving that dispatch from the commander-in-chief, just one day after recognizing that the Loudoun Valley east of the Blue Ridge, the route that Lincoln talked about is clear, George McClellan settles on the fact that his army will advance on the east side of the Blue Ridge Mountains, utilizing the Loudoun Valley as his advance route, uh, ultimately towards Richmond. Now here uh, on the screen is an overview map of the eastern theater of the war, and essentially what Lincoln is talking about uh, and, and if you're at home, certainly I would encourage you to pull out a map, even a modern map of uh, Virginia uh, today, and you'll be able to see exactly what Lincoln is discussing. 
But again, with the Confederate Army positioned around Martinsburg and Winchester, uh, elements of the Union Army, before they crossed the Potomac River, were actually closer to Richmond than the Confederate Army was. So what Lincoln was hoping McClellan and the Army of the Potomac could do is steal a march on uh, the Army of Northern Virginia, something the Army of the Potomac was not known for and that did, it did not often do, uh, steal a march on the Army of Northern Virginia, get between Robert E. Lee and the Confederate capital, potentially find some high, uh, uh, ground with, uh, that was favorable towards the Union Army, and then be able to defeat Lee uh, before the winter set on, and, which was a, a bad season for campaigning. So McClellan settled on that, and just a couple of days later, after informing Lincoln of that fact on October 24th uh, and October 25th, McClellan began to lay out the tenets of his plan, which was essentially this. Again, looking at uh, a map of the Loudoun Valley, uh, you can see is, is between those two uh, orange lines there on the map. Again, the, the line towards the left of the screen is the Blue Ridge Mountains, and the, the darker line uh, towards the, the right side of the screen is the Bull Run or the Catoctin Mountains. But everything framed in between that is the Loudoun Valley. So McClellan's plan called for his army to march swiftly, uh, basically cutting its, uh, itself off from supplies. The Union soldiers would march with 10 days worth of rations packed into their haversacks, knapsacks, and wagons during this campaign because McClellan realized that his army might be cut off from its supply base. But uh, armed with that, the Union army was going to move in two columns. Uh, the left or westmost column under the command of Fitz John Porter, consisting of the 2nd and 5th Corps, their objective was basically to march along the eastern base of the Blue Ridge Mountains and seize each of the mountain gaps in the Blue Ridge so that uh, they could secure the Union supply line that was going to continually grow and grow and grow the further south that the Union Army advanced. Then the strike force, if you will, the other side of McClellan's uh, command would be marching uh, more towards the east, closer to the Bull Run Mountains. That was under the command, ultimately, of Ambrose Burnside and consisted of three Army Corps, the 1st Corps, the 6th Corps, and the 9th Corps. So beginning on uh, October 26th, Union Cavalry under the command of Alfred Pleasanton is going to begin crossing the Potomac River on two pontoon bridges at Berlin, Maryland. Uh, what's now known as Brunswick today. Here's an image that's it's heavily debated about whether or not this is showing uh, federal troops crossing in October of 1862 or July of 1863 in the aftermath of the Gettysburg campaign. But nonetheless, it gives you a very good idea of just what this crossing uh, might have looked like. Union soldiers recognized what this meant going back across the Potomac River. And as a New York Times uh, correspondent wrote watching federal soldiers thousands and thousands and thousands of them crossing at these two pontoon bridges, he said of this, uh, only when the column crossing the Potomac by the pontoon bridge stepped on Virginia soil, one of those impressive omens which the Greeks called fate seemed to thrill through the men and lusty cheers spontaneously broke from 20,000 throats, awoke responsive echoes from the Virginia hills and announced that the third campaign was commenced. Once the Federal Army began moving into the cleared out uh, Loudoun Valley, they found something that was relatively unexpected for them uh, in Northern Virginia. Loudoun County was really almost a microcosm, and the Loudoun Valley, if you will, as a whole was almost a microcosm of what the country was experiencing at this point. Of course, divided over uh, the issue of slavery and over the Civil War. The northern portion of the Loudoun Valley was predominantly, but not entirely, populated by uh, Quakers and uh, German populations that were usually favorable towards the Union soldiers. And so you'll see here a sketch of Ambrose Burnside on horseback outside of Lovettsville. You can see Union soldiers cheering him on, but it wasn't just Union soldiers that were cheering him on, uh, but many civilians as well. However, uh, the Loudoun Valley had remained relatively unscathed by this point in the war, despite its sort of divided loyalties, um, if you will. However, there had been some instances of truly, uh, I know we, we use, use the term so much that it's almost a cliche of brother against brother uh, as the Civil War, but in Loudoun Valley, that was literally the case. That was actually happening. And another newspaper correspondent said of this of the Loudoun Valley, he said, in that section of the country, the war has been conducted with a virulence and bitterness that you of the North can scarcely conceive, literally setting brother against brother and father against son, destroying all domestic ties and natural feeling. But this would really be the first time during the American Civil War that the Loudoun Valley would truly experience uh, the horrors of war.
Though the horrors of war for civilians did not just come when the two armies met on a battlefield, but uh, as will be the case here, especially for the Union Army in the uh, Loudoun Valley, the, um, their orders are going to be uh, changing a little bit. I've already talked a little bit about the, the Emancipation Proclamation, excuse me, and how that is going to bring about a change uh, in the course of the Union war effort and in the course of the war. But now the hard hand of war, as it's often referred to, is starting to be felt, and Union armies are starting to apply it uh, to uh, Confederate territory that they invade. Uh, this is a, a picture from one of my favorite books, or a sketch. It's Cy Clegg and his pard, um, written by a veteran. It's sort of a, a fictional account, but based on his real um, uh, actions during the course of the Civil War. And this is just a great illustration to me of how even though when the Army of the Potomac was moving into the Loudoun Valley, they were actually under strict orders not to harm uh, private property and civilian property. Now, not a lot of the sol or not all of the soldiers uh, followed those orders. Uh, some of that is just because of a different uh, uh, belief. Of course, George McClellan, being a war Democrat, thought that uh, a much softer hand should be used to deal with the Confederate populations, whereas some Union soldiers believed that they would take matters into their own hands and show the Southern population just what war really was. Uh, no matter which side of the spectrum a soldier came on, obviously, uh, simple life instincts take hold. They have to keep themselves warm. We're getting into the fall of 1862. It's beginning to get cold. It's rainy. At night, it's in fact so cold during many of the nights of this campaign that the water would freeze inside of Union and Confederate soldiers' canteens. And, of course, one of the best ways to get to keep yourself warm is to build a fire. So because the orders were relatively limited about what Union soldiers could do to Confederate property, the orders were to each uh, column of troops that when tearing down a fence for use as firewood, they could only take the top rail of that fence. So here's what you see Cy Clegg and his pards doing, is just simply taking the top rail of that fence. Well, that's all fine because they've built their fires, they took the top rail, and they move on. And then, of course, as I talked about, there's five Union Army Corps moving through the Loudoun Valley. Once one corps clears out of an area, then here comes a second uh, corps, and their orders are to take the top rail. So what do they do? Well, they take what was once the, uh, not quite the top rail, but close to the top. And so you can see how after so many different Union formations move through, that eventually the Loudoun Valley is just going to be essentially wiped clean. Uh, one Union soldier said that it was not quite the land of milk and honey, but it was a fair equivalent. Uh, the Loudoun Valley was. And so Union soldiers were taking uh, plenty of uh, provisions from the local population as they possibly could. Now getting into the military movements uh, of the campaign itself, it won't be until several days into the action when uh, the two armies really begin to engage. Uh, and that won't start until October the 31st, so Halloween, uh, five days already into the campaign itself. Just a quick recap, you can see the dark arrows there on the map, of course, symbolize the uh, Army of the Potomac's infantry. As I mentioned, George McClellan planned to move five corps directly south through the Loudoun Valley and two additional corps uh, under the command of Franz Siegel, the 3rd Corps and the 11th Corps, were supposed to arrive along the Orange and Alexandria Railroad and meet up with the Army of the Potomac somewhere in the area of Thoroughfare Gap. So McClellan is going to be getting reinforcements during the course of the campaign. Uh, he will embark on the campaign, by the way, with about uh, 100,000 men or so. Uh, so both armies have certainly been rebuilt uh, from the losses that they suffered during the summer of 1862. Uh, McClellan, as I mentioned, will be cutting off himself basically from his supply lines. The army, the soldiers are going to be marching with 10 days worth of rations. And the idea is they have to move through the Loudoun Valley quick enough before those 10 days of rations uh, expire. Uh, and their goal is to reach the Manassas Gap Railroad, which then McClellan is going to start to use that as his supply line. So the ultimate goal here, besides getting between the Confederate Army and Richmond, is to reach the Manassas Gap Railroad. Now for the Confederate Army, they are going to react a little bit slower. As I mentioned, the first crossing of Union soldiers across the Potomac River is on October 26th. Lee will not react until two days later on October 28th once he realizes that this is, in fact, a serious movement, not just a diversion on the part of George McClellan. So what Lee will begin to do is he will march uh, half of his army, the First Corps at this point, which this is the first campaign that the Army of Northern Virginia is going to be utilizing the corps structure officially, uh, in the campaign. James Longstreet's 1st Corps is going to uh, quickly march uh, through the Shenandoah Valley to Front Royal 
and cross the Blue Ridge Mountains and take up a position behind the Rappahannock River uh, and Rapidan River somewhere in the area of Culpeper Courthouse. So that's meant to be, again, a blocking position. Um, everybody's fighting for the interior lines. Lincoln wants McClellan. McClellan would like to get to Culpeper first to get between the Confederate Army and its capital. And of course, Robert E. Lee wants to deprive McClellan of that opportunity. So Longstreet is going to begin to move. While Longstreet is marching and while these actions are going on in the Loudoun Valley, Stonewall Jackson is going to be left in the Shenandoah Valley um, as basically to serve as a menace to George McClellan's right flank. And if Jackson sees an opportunity, he is told to strike at the, uh, the right flank, again, the moving right flank of the Army of the Potomac as it's maneuvering. Uh, Jackson won't leave the Shenandoah Valley until this campaign is over, and so he's going to remain there for quite some time before eventually marching on to Fredericksburg and joining the Confederate Army there. Now, the first actions uh, to take place, as I mentioned, will be on October 31st, uh, and that is between a cavalry brigade um, under the command of Williams Wickham. It was firstly, uh, firstly uh, Fitzhugh Lee's cavalry brigade, but uh, Lee was uh, out of commission at this point, so Wickham takes command. Stuart, though, only has about 1,000 horsemen with him uh, when he crosses over the Blue Ridge Mountains with Wickham's brigade. Uh, and a lot of that is, again, because of the, uh, the horse flesh that Stuart had, had really killed on that Chambersburg raid. And also for both Union and Confederate armies, there was a disease running through uh, the horse flesh uh, of both armies. So neither cavalry is going to be quite up to snuff uh, at this point in the campaign. But Lee is going to dispatch uh, Stuart into the Loudoun Valley with the intention of serving as a speed bump to the Army of the Potomac, slowing it down, buying time for James Longstreet to take up his blocking position there outside of Culpeper Courthouse. On October 31st, uh, Stuart's cavalrymen are going to stumble upon uh, vedettes of the 1st Rhode Island Cavalry in the area of Mountville along the Snickersville Turnpike. Uh, so it's between on the map there between the, the towns of Aldi and Philemont. Uh, the, the First Rhode Island Cavalry is going to be routed. They fall back on the rest of their command, which is a brigade of cavalry under the command of uh, uh, George Bayard. Um, Bayard is going to uh, see what happens to the First Rhode Island Cavalry, which is one man killed, uh, one wounded, but 52 men captured by Stuart's horsemen. And so uh, Bayard is just going to take his brigade out of the, the picture entirely. And when he writes to Alfred Pleasant in the next day, uh, Bayard is going to be doing so from Willard's Hotel in downtown Washington, D.C. So uh, cavalry from the east is not going to be much uh, aid to Alfred Pleasanton's cavalrymen as they're moving south through the Loudoun Valley. The next day, fighting is going to erupt between Pleasanton's cavalrymen and Stuart's uh, at Philemont. Uh, and then this will usher in what is often referred to as the Battle of Unison, uh, typically referred to or, or being dated as having been fought from November 1st to the 3rd of 1862. Here's the major landmark in the town of Unison today. Uh, just a, a, a real quick funny side story, again, showing how the Loudoun Valley serves as a microcosm of this divided nation. Uh, Unison was initially founded, the town was initially founded as Union, not Unison. Uh, but in 1829, the citizens changed it to Unison. However, the official name of the voting district in that section of Loudoun County was still referred to as the Union Voting District. So on May 23rd, 1861, when Virginians had the chance to go to the polls and determine if they wanted their state to secede from the Union or not, the Union Voting District uh, actually voted 150 to 0 in favor of dissolving the Union and having Virginia leave uh, the United States and join the Confederate States of America. Uh, but nonetheless, November 2nd of 1862 it was a Sunday, and there at the Unison Methodist Church, uh, the surrounding farmers and the citizens of Unison had gathered at the church to begin their services. Suddenly, the first thing that they heard that made them realize today might not just be any normal Sunday was the tune uh, taken up by a, a band, the 6th United States Cavalry Band, listening to the Mockingbird that the citizens caught uh, coming in on the wind uh, from the Union advance. Then suddenly, several guns under the command of John Pelham rolled up into the field on the other side of the road from the church and began to open fire. And the two sides, uh, at about 1,000 yards, traded artillery shots, uh, dismounted cavalry maneuvers through the town itself. And Harris von Bork talked about uh, what the fighting was like uh, in unison. He said, the retreat through Union was admirably covered by Pelham with his artillery and was executed with great steadiness and order under a perfect hail of shot and shell. 
which, crashing through the houses of the little village, had already set on fire several stables and straw ricks. The furious flames leaping from one to another of these great masses of combustible material and the dense volumes of smoke that rolled from them added to the terror and confusion of the scene, which now became truly frightful. Again, the citizens of the Loudoun Valley were for the first time truly feeling the effects of war. Now, what Jeb Stewart was uh, trying to do, again, in, this, uh, in the Loudoun Valley is he's not fighting for space. He's not fighting for battlefield victories, so to speak. He's just simply trying to slow the Union advance as much as he possibly can and keep uh, the gaps open in the Blue Ridge Mountains so that James Longstreet's Corps can maneuver through them. So once Stuart feels plenty of pressure uh, from Alfred Pleasanton, who also uh, gets help from a Union Infantry Brigade under the command of J. William Hoffman uh, at this point, then Stuart is going to fall back from Unison. He falls back to uh, high ground just southwest of the town uh, at the old Quaker Meeting House. And uh, this is where John Pelham is going to have one of his finer days, uh, perhaps his finest day, I would argue, uh, as an artillerist during the course of the American Civil War. Pelham is going to do what um, he, he is known as doing. He takes an artillery piece out beyond the Union left flank. You can see it, uh, that arrow there in the map uh, showing the, the fighting at the Quaker Meeting House. Pelham takes one gun out beyond the Union left flank. Supposedly, he sights the gun himself personally at a distance of 800 yards, and the first shot fells the entire color guard of the 7th Indiana Infantry there on the far left. And then once the Union artillery gains the range of Pelham's gun, Pelham will fall back to another piece of advantageous ground and continue playing a game almost of leapfrog with the Federal artillerists. Um, I know what he does at, at Fredericksburg is, of course, certainly talked about it. That's where he gets the nickname of the gallant Pelham. But a historian of the long arm of the Army of Northern Virginia uh, says that this is really almost perhaps a greater day for John Pelham than December 13th of 1862. Ultimately, though, Pelham's heroics are not going to be enough to stop the Union advance. And again, once Stuart starts to feel pressure on his flanks and in his front, he's going to fall back to the next position and the next. And so all day on November 2nd, Jeb Stuart will hold a total of six different defensive positions there in the Loudoun Valley. But by November the 3rd, uh, by the evening of November 2nd, rather, um, Stuart has been pushed back to the outskirts of the town of Upperville along the Ashby's Gap Turnpike. Upperville was an important town, not just because of all the road networks and the roads leading into it, but also it sits just a few miles east of Ashby's Gap, where there was Confederate infantry under the command of John Walker. And uh, Stuart was trying to keep the Union eyes blind to the presence of Confederate infantry here in the Loudoun Valley, and then, of course, also to open up uh, or keep that mountain pass open. Um, some very intense fighting will be had on November the 3rd outside of Upperville. Uh, you can see there will be Union attacks on three different fronts. Stewart's cavalrymen are protecting the three road networks leading from the north into Upperville, though ultimately it's going to take a bayonet charge by the members of the 95th New York Infantry to uh, drive Stewart's line back to Upperville and then ultimately drive it all the way back to Ashby's Gap itself. According to some uh, Confederate accounts, it's only uh, the efforts of a Whitworth rifle artillery piece that's positioned in Ashby's Gap itself that is able to stop the uh, Federal uh, pursuit towards Ashby's Gap. But in reality, that is irrelevant by that point because Jeb Stewart has decided that the Ashby Gap no longer needs to be held because the Confederate infantry has vacated its positions there. And so uh, the Ashby Gap falls into uh, Union hands, which is, of course, the plan of George McClellan of keeping uh, possession of the succession of gaps in the Blue Ridge Mountains as he continues to advance uh, further and further south. So on November 4th and 5th, the action is once again going to continue. And this is as uh, Northerners are just wrapping up their voting in the midterm elections in 1862 while all this action is going on, which is going to come to play in just a little bit, but the actions will take place closer to the area of the Manassas Gap Railroad. And by November 4th, November 5th, uh, the Army of the Potomac is going to be in possession of that railroad, which again was the objective point uh, for the Army of the Potomac so that it could reopen uh, or have a rail supply line rather than just carrying all of its supplies uh, itself. However, by that point, by November 3rd, all of this is irrelevant. Because when Abraham Lincoln had laid out his plans for George McClellan and had given orders for McClellan's advance across the Potomac River, 
Lincoln had basically made a private promise to himself that if McClellan was not able to reach Culpeper Courthouse before Lee's army did, that Lincoln would then relieve McClellan of command. November 3rd, the van of James Longstreet's first corps of the Army of Northern Virginia begins to arrive in Culpeper Courthouse. Lincoln receives word of that just a couple of days later, and on November 5th, he is going to draft orders that will take a couple of days to reach McClellan, but Lincoln will draft orders uh, removing McClellan from command. We're going to get more uh, to that in just a second. One of the um, true highlights, I think, of the Loudoun Valley Campaign, and really the, the heroes, if you will, of the Loudoun Valley Campaign, something that doesn't get a lot of credit, I think, is the Union Cavalry. And often we look to later fights in 1863 at, uh, at Hartwood Church, Kelly's Ford, uh, or even as late as Brandy Station as being the moment where the Union Cavalry uh, really starts to be matched toe-to-toe -to -toe or hoof-to-hoof, -hoof, if you will, uh, with the, the Confederate Cavalry of the Army of Northern Virginia. Um, but throughout all the cavalry actions here, no, Jeb Stuart is not fighting to secure a battlefield. He's simply fighting to slow down the advance of the Federal Cavalry. But every single time in the Loudoun Valley, when uh, either a regiment or brigade size uh, force of Union Cavalry meets an equivalent number of Confederate cavalrymen, the Union Cavalry always have the upper hand. And uh, early in the campaign, uh, following their ride around uh, George McClellan's army, uh, William Blackford, a Confederate cavalryman, wrote this about their viewpoints, the Confederate cavalry's viewpoints of the Union cavalry. He said, the prestige of our cavalry was such that the opposition of their cavalry was considered of very little account by us. So he did not think much, and the Confederate cavalry did not think much at all of their Union counterparts. However, by the end of this campaign, uh, a correspondent in the Philadelphia Inquirer would, would write, Many persons have decried our cavalry, comparing it as next to nothing alongside of Stuart's. Since the crossing from Berlin up to the present, Averill's and Pleasanton's commands have proved themselves fully equal to any cavalry. They have driven Stuart in every fight. And again, even when Stuart was fighting to hold on to ground, uh, for example, on November 5th at Barbie's Crossroads, what's known as Hume, Virginia today, uh, the Federal Cavalry would achieve the upper hand. It was an incredibly intense cavalry fight, one that doesn't get hardly any attention in the literature of cavalry uh, in the American Civil War. But the, the Federal Cavalry, again, is going to be able to show that it can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with its Confederate counterparts. Uh, and this is going to be a, a dramatic shift for the Army of the Potomac uh, in, in its ways of operating. However, ultimately, by the time Union cavalry has driven their Confederate counterparts to the Rappahannock River, the campaign suddenly comes to a screeching halt. And that is because on the night of November 7th, 1862, in the midst of a snowstorm, just as George McClellan at 11 p.m. is in the middle of writing one of those infamous or famous letters to his wife, there is a knock on his tent pole. One of the men that walked into McClellan's tent was certainly somebody that he recognized, his good friend and Corps commander, Ambrose Burnside. The other man was somebody that had been rumored to have accompanied or to have joined the Army of the Potomac in the midst of the campaign, and that was Brigadier General Catharinus Buckingham, one of the best-named generals you'll find in the entire American Civil War. After a bit of small talk between the three men, Buckingham, uh, a bit uncomfortable, finally got to the, uh, the, the crux of why he was there and he handed George McClellan orders relieving McClellan of command of the Army of the Potomac and placing Ambrose Burnside at its head. McClellan supposedly read it with a simple stare and then handed the note to Burnside and told him, well, Burns, I turn the command over to you. However, after a few minutes of consultation, uh, Burnside was able to convince McClellan that rather than following orders to go back to Trenton, New Jersey, McClellan's hometown immediately, that McClellan would stay on a few days and help Burnside figure out uh, the logistics of, and the whereabouts of all the different pieces of the, uh, the Army of the Potomac. And so uh, in a couple days of fanfare outside of Warrenton, George McClellan is going to review different elements of the Army of the Potomac. Uh, some members of the Army of the Potomac will write that this was a, a great change, that uh, uh, finally they had rid themselves of McClellan. Others would write that this was a, a terrible change and, and talked openly of actually marching on Washington to uh, depose the Lincoln administration. Uh, but ultimately, uh, McClellan quelled any, any talk of that uh, and he would go on uh, peacefully to his home in Trenton, New Jersey, waiting to be called on for the rest of the war, but of course never receiving uh, 
that call. Now, George McClellan's removal from command can be attributed to several different factors at this point in the war. Firstly, I think that his rift between uh, himself and Lincoln had just grown too wide that the commander-in-chief could not operate with the really most important general uh, in, his, in the entire United States Army at that point. Secondly, uh, McClellan was a war Democrat. Uh, the midterm elections had just wrapped up, and so you could argue, and, and Lincoln did basically say that there was no need now to have McClellan as this war Democrat to try and become uh, a unifying force uh, in, in those midterm elections, which um, Democrats did win some seats in those elections, but ultimately the Republicans still held control of both houses of Congress and most of the state governorships uh, and legislatures. But no matter what you think of, of George McClellan, um, this is probably one of the better known stories of the entire American Civil War, of McClellan being relieved from command. Uh, you look in newspapers today, people talk about it all the time. Uh, of, of comparing it to presidents uh, having uh, disputes with generals in the field. Uh, even if you go back to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, you'll find mentions of this in newspapers, uh, comparing the past constantly to the present. But uh, it's not just relevant for us today, but I think it also symbolizes really uh, one of the last pillars of a conservative, uh, soft-hand war being fought uh, on the part of the Union war effort. Uh, that pillar now collapses and it falls. And so this symbolizes a great change uh, in the Union war effort. And I think it's not just that McClellan's removal warrants a lot more of discussion and study, but the entire Loudoun Valley campaign does because it places in context, uh, again, one of these seminal events of, of Lincoln's role as commander-in-chief uh, during the American Civil War. So I thank you all very much. I hope that you're able to get out and uh, see some of these Loudoun uh, Valley battlefields. Many of them look almost exactly like they did uh, in 1862. You can still drive a lot of the same roads, see a lot of the same stone walls and buildings that these soldiers saw uh, and passed by. You can go into the Unison Methodist Church and see graffiti left behind by wounded Union soldiers from that action uh, there in unison. But I hope now that there's a bit of uh, sort of the fog of war is lifted, if you will, from the interlude between the Battle of Antietam and the Battle of Fredericksburg to show that there, was things, there were things that were going on uh, at that point, and the Loudoun Valley certainly deserves a bit more mention than what it has often received in Civil War historiography. So thank you all very much. <laughs>